Okay, everybody, welcome to Bioenergetic Helpline, a supplemental episode that we're going to talk about the Randall cycle. And if you're not aware, uh, Bart K, Professor Bart K, <laughs> has uh, made a few videos about uh, kind of some off the cuff almost comments that uh, we had talked about with the Randall cycle. And so uh, my good friends, Jay Feldman and Mike Fave, are we're going to dissect the Randall cycle and um, kind of clean, clean up some of the comments and make sure we dot our, t our I's and cross our T's and do a thorough job of talking about it. So, um, Jay, did you want to kick things off? Yeah, again, just for a little bit of context. So, yeah, we were commenting on a video that Bart did in response to Paul Saladino and found the arguments that he made so self-evidently incorrect and, you know, to the point that they were funny. So we, you know, we're just kind of bringing them up casually. Didn't feel like there was any need to actually explain in depth, you know, and go through the mechanisms as far as how the things that he was saying were incorrect. Uh, you know, it was just meant to be, as you say, casual, kind of off the cuff. But in this video, we'll dig into some of those mechanisms. It kind of gives us an opportunity for the listeners of the helpline to uh, have a deeper understanding there and, and uh, you know, some of the intricacies as far as the Randall cycle goes. But uh, yeah, we know Bart will continue to make videos about us and that's fine. He'll, you know, he, <laughs> he uh, is going to continue like with the immature, you know, insulting and mocking and, and all of that. And that's fine. Which too. I don't know about you, but I can't get enough of like when I go on YouTube, that's all I care about pretty much. I, I just want to fill my aggressive rage bucket when I go on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can definitely do it. <laughs> yeah. So we're obviously like, we have no interest in playing the insult game or, or anything like that. Like this is just about the information and we'll be talking again a lot about the Randall cycle. We'll be citing papers directly from Randall himself and, uh, you know, going through some figures and everything. And uh, yeah, I don't know, Mike, do you have anything else you want to add before we dig in? Um, no, I think that overall it's just like Bart has asked or mentioned for us to debate him a couple times. And I want to just make a statement on that. I think it's from. I don't, perhaps I'll speak for myself, but I think it may apply to all of us. There's no point in having a debate with him on the mechanisms because his like his stated and we're going to play the clips, but his stated understanding of the mechanisms are patently false. So we're not going to be like to go into a debate in that situation. The mechanisms are the mechanisms. It's quite clear from the Randall papers and from other paper papers. I did a video going over the mechanisms of at least one portion of the Randall cycle. We're going to cover the other portion as well. Um, so, yeah, I don't I don't think a debate is reasonable. Number one, because we're going to just lay out the mechanisms for what they are here. And then number two, because there's no point in debating somebody who's going to or go into a scientific debate with somebody who's going to continue to lobby personal ad hominem attacks and just like ridiculous statements and phrases calling us charlatans, morons, buffoons, what, what? make well, in the inevitable uh, reply to this video, I would challenge Bart not to use argument from authority one time. <laughs> like, yeah. Because that's like his whole shtick is this argument from authority. But uh, I'll, I'll keep going, Mike. Sorry. Uh, I just think that it's like if you have so much experience and research and whatnot, and you have so much credibility and knowledge, I don't understand why it was necessary to like make denigrating statements about nurses and bedpans and then like try to discredit Jay or Danny or me from a perspective of lack of credibility. When we're just discussing mechanisms of the Randall cycle, we lobby no personal attack. So I think that those things themselves invalidate like ha moving into any type of debate because of the, la the lack of respect overall for like having a scientific debate. And then also the clear lack of understanding of the mechanisms, you know, there's just, there's no reason to go there. So that's, <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Just, just to be clear, though, we're not victims here. We're we can handle the abuse. It's uh, he can respond. He, he obviously he felt attacked by us laughing on the video or something, and I did make some disparaging mark, uh, marks uh, remarks about his shtick, and so uh, he can respond in any way he wants. But we're we're most doing this for our listeners. You know, if you want to better understand the Randall cycle, this is the video for you. And uh, and again, we can explain our, our cohesive worldview uh, uh, um, in great length and detail. And that's what we're going to try to do here. And um, 
again, Bar- Bart's whole thing is being disparaging. So that's just who he is, I think. Yeah. So right. again, we're just going to focus on the mechanisms here of the Randall cycle. Specifically, as Jay said, we're going to use Randall's papers to describe the mechanisms. And then we're actually going to pull quotes specifically of what Bart said and then discuss following. There's not going to be any name calling. There's not going to be any disrespectful stuff. It's literally just going to be about the 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 concepts and information. Yeah. And again, as you mentioned, Danny, we're expecting like, a, you know, we're expecting a response video that's going to in- include all those insults. It's going to include a lot of no, you're wrong. That's false. Cutting our sentences into three words and then saying that doesn't make sense and then doing it again <laughs> three words later. We know that's going to be the making, case. We're not making fun of my laugh over, right. and over and over again. So we'll just expect that to happen. Naturally. Well, that means we're wrong, Danny, because you <laughs> you laughed. <laughs> yeah, and and that's fine. Like we're not here to change Bart's mind or anyone else's. Right? It's just to, it's just to share the information. We know that again, regardless of what we say, Bart's going to say, "No, you're wrong. I'm right." Even if he actually agrees with our point, which has happened in a handful of the videos, which I'm sure there'll be a handful more of him of his you know take on what we're saying where we'll be right and then he'll still say we're wrong, even though he acknowledged that we're right. I mean, it's just, we know that's going to happen and that's totally fine. This isn't, as you said, Danny, for anyone other than listeners to actually be able to see the mechanisms here and and underst- you know have a deeper understanding of what's actually going on in the random cycle versus what isn't and uh, clear the air in terms of those things. Yeah. And the other thing I think that's important to point out is that in the first episode, and you kind of mentioned this, Jay, we... Because when we initially watched the video, we like thought the mechanisms were so self-evidently incorrect. We thought it was kind of like a joke. We thought it was kind of funny. And then we didn't do the due diligence and dot our T's and or dot our I's and cross our T's, whatever, whatever the phrase is, and going through the exact mechanisms. Like we discussed the mechanisms, we mentioned them, we mentioned them off cusp, offhand, and just kind of like blaze through them instead of really going into depth. And so this video is also us basically covering our bases appropriately for the audience and for ourselves, just out of respect for everybody, right? I think if we're going to make statements on something, then we should we should do our due diligence and really and really uh, cover those bases appropriately. Well, we I also don't think it was warranted. The only thing reason I think it's warranted now is because of the response videos. But what we are what you're getting at, Mike, is what we're not going to do is create a two and a half hour video on a 30, you know, 30 or 45 minute video, just saying, no, you're wrong, false, and you're leaving it that, or you didn't discuss this other thing, so everything's invalidated, or that study was on rats, right? We're actually going to provide evidence, provide citations, go through the mechanisms in detail, and discuss those things because there's, it's just a waste of time to have, especially for a listener, right, to be putting out such wasteful content like that like our the previous episode was meant to be casual off the cuff it was meant to be just kind of entertaining it was entertaining for us you know in the same way that bart regards himself as an entertainer that's what his videos are right he's not doing a two and a half hour video and here's what the randall cycle is and when he does we'll see what happens so and of course that's like a three minute video here or there so <laughs> this is our last video was was off the cuff casual it didn't need to be anything more than that now that there's been a response we'll actually dig into the details and and that's how you would actually respond to somebody saying you're wrong if you wanted to have a credible response. Yeah. All right, let's jump in. Cool. So the other thing I'll say too is as far as this video, like what we're doing now, we're just talking about what the Randall cycle is and isn't. And we'll also maybe talk about when or when it is not activated, what that actually means. Uh, and we're not going to be talking about all the other implications. We're not talking about whether this means you should or should not be eating carbs or fats. These are all completely tangential, important pieces but are outside the scope of just what actually is the Randall cycle. I think that's the fundamental piece here that at least is disagreed, disagreed upon. And then, of course, after that, in future videos or whatever, and also we've done this in episodes on our podcast, Mike, we also did this on previous helplines, just discussing the implications and what that actually means in terms of what we would want to do, which is important. But again, outside the scope of this video, we're just going to be talking about, again, what the Randall cycle is and isn't and when it is and isn't activated in what context. Yeah, and I also spent 45 minutes going through the mechanisms of fat oxidations, inhibition of glucose oxidation, and the importance of glucose oxidation in different circumstances and the, the, some of the implications of it as well. So there's a, and there's, again, there's no, like it was just on that, the, me- the mechanisms there in the Randall cycle specifically and nothing, there's no, like, it wasn't really about anything to do with Bart. That video wasn't re- made for Bart or anything like that. It was made 
just because I felt like we didn't cover it in detail enough when we discussed it on our first helpline. And it also wasn't about evolution. It wasn't about all, like, you know, you could extend it out to all those things. But what, what I know you're we're kind of alluding to here is that in Bart's responses, instead of actually responding to the piece of material, if there isn't a good, you know, if he doesn't have a good response to it, he'll bring in all sorts of other topics, all sorts of other things that we aren't actually saying or, or you know, put words in our mouth, which again is fine. He can do whatever he wants. We don't care. But we aren't going to be, we are intentionally in this video just talking about the Randall cycle itself, what it is and isn't, and what context it is relevant to in terms of activation or deactivation, if you wanted to use those terms. And we aren't talking about those other things. So if those other things are brought up, it has nothing to do with what we're saying, at least in terms of what the Randall cycle is, again, and when, uh, you know, the context of when it is or isn't activated. Yep. Cool. All right. All right. Let's go. So we'll start out with uh, some clips. Actually, just one clip, which is in Bart's video response to Paul uh, discussing what the Randall cycle has to do with. And then we'll show a couple of clips after that is Bart kind of going through the mechanisms of what the Randall cycle is. So that's kind of the first things we'll go through here. Anyway, carry on. Prefers to use the fuel that is already being used. No, it's got nothing to do with what is already being used, Paul. Nothing whatsoever. It has to do with what is available outside the cell, knocking on the door trying to get in. And ergo, it's also to do with what is in the cell cytosol. Simple as that. It's nothing to do with what is being used. It's to do with what is there ready to be used. Okay? Just in human biochemistry. So, so completely wrong, Paul. Completely wrong there. What I want to do... All right. So the first clip, what we have is him saying that the Randall cycle is what he's referring to. He said, basically, the Randall cycle just has to do with what's going on in the cytosol and what's going on out, outside of the cell, right? Yep. So the next clips we're going to show, basically, again, these are going to be clips from Bart. We're going to be clips where he's talking about the mechanisms of the Randall cycle. We'll describe that they're not all correct, but he describes those mechanisms and those mechanisms all have to do not with what's going on outside the cell or what's just with uh, going on in the cytosol, but what's actually going on in terms of the oxidative metabolism of these substrates. So the, and this is something that the Randall cycle settled on, uh, centered on, which I'll share a quote in a moment. But basically, again, the, the point that, or the thing that Bart is sharing here, he's saying the Randall cycle is about substrate in the cytosol and, in, and outside the cell. But in reality, all of the mechanisms that determine the inhibition of the opposing substrate being oxidized have to do with that substrate being oxidized. They have to do with the oxidation. Just the fact that it's in the cytosol or the fact that it's outside of the cell is not the Randall cycle and there's no mechanism there for that inhibition of uptake or oxidation. It, it's, it necessitates the oxidation of the substrate. Do you have anything you want to add there, Mike, before I share the quotes? Well, that's what Paul is uh, saying from the get-go. <laughs> that's Paul's statement, which was correct. So yeah, go ahead and let let uh, Bart go through his... Well, uh, so I'm just going to share a, a quote real, real quick from a Randall paper that just very clearly states that while... And again, so the an important point here, of course, is that the substrate that's available in the cytosol or the substrate that's available outside the cell will in turn have an impact on what's being oxidized. It's not the only factor. There's a lot of factors that'll go into what's actually being oxidized in the cell, but it is the oxidation of the glucose or the oxidation of the fat that is what is going to be required to inhibit the oxidation of the opposite substrate. And so that's the point here. It's not about what's in the cytosol. It's not about what's outside the cytosol. Only as much, or at least it's only about those things as much as they affect the oxidation. It's the oxidation of the glucose or the oxidation of the fat that is required for the inhibition of the, of the opposite. And so Randall has a couple of uh, quotes describing this in his 1988 paper. I'll show those real quick. So this paper is titled Mechanisms Decreasing Glucose Oxidation in Diabetes and Starvation, Role of Lipid Fuels and Hormones. So he states that the oxidation of glucose in animals, including man, is increased by exercise and decreased by starvation, diabetes, high fat diet, oxidation of lipid fuels, and experimental forms of obesity. So again, here he's just saying the oxidation of glucose, and then uh, says it farther down, is decreased by oxidation of lipid fuels. Uh, he also describes, so in his original paper, he was focused more on the availability of substrate, but that's because a lot of the mechanisms weren't described at that point. So he says that here, he says that when the idea of the cycle was first published in 1963, comparatively little was known about enzyme regulation, 
Allosteric regulation of enzymes has been formulated as a concept, but knowledge of reversible phosphorylation of enzymes was confined to glycogen phosphorylase and phosphorylase kinase, and no protein kinase or phosphatase had been purified and characterized. So what he's just describing here is, again, that in the original paper, he was focused more on the availability and substrate of substrate in the cytosol and outside the cell, but then now it's more about the oxidation because that's now been recognized. And he says this again very clearly down here. So he says, and again, this just encapsulates it fully. It's important to emphasize that the glucose fatty acid cycle, that's the Randall cycle, is concerned essentially with the effects of fatty acid and or ketone body oxidation on glucose catabolism or oxidation. It will therefore not be applicable to those muscles and other tissues which lack mitochondria or in which mitochondrial metabolism is not the major site of ATP synthesis. So what he's saying here is that it is absolutely required for the Randall cycle to have the oxidation of, in this case, he's talking about fatty acids inhibiting glucose. Just the availability will not have an effect. For example, you need mitochondrial mit mit uh, metabolism of ATP synthesis or of ATP in order to have this effect. So the effect is entirely dependent on the oxidation. It's not the availability. Also not entirely what, it's not entirely about what's in the cytosol either, because that's right, what right. Bart is talking about, whether there's a couple statements about high blood glucose or what's in the blood or what's also, also what's going on specifically in the cytosol. Those play a part, but the main focus is oxidation. And that's Randall's quote literally just states that. <laughs> right. And those only play a part in so much as they affect oxidation or as in so much as they are the products of oxidation. But it's the actual oxidation that is a requirement for the Randall cycle, regardless of what's happening elsewhere. Yep. Okay. All right. So I'm going to share. So now Bard acknowledges this or not directly, but in these next clips, he's talking about how the oxidation of either substrate affects the oxidation and, and uptake of, of the other substrate. So I'm going to share. This is going to be four clips uh they're, they're not too long but four clips from his podcast with nutrition with judy and these clips are very telling and and we're going to spend a lot of time after them going through the different graphics and everything because he explains what he understands as far as the mechanisms of the randall cycle and yeah, this is not, not the randall cycle right and we <laughs> said that a lot in the first time we discussed this because it's just not but we'll actually in the same why We'll explain why, we'll explain what is, and we'll go through the graphics and everything ourselves, which, yeah, we thought was self-evident in the first video from someone who knows what the Randall cycle is. Before you go, I can just, so we're going to, there's going to be a BART response, and he, in his response, he's going to, he's going to, when we say it's just not the Randall cycle, he's going to go on a tangent saying like, okay, well, you need to explain where I'm wrong then, and you haven't explained anything, so therefore you're wrong. So for anybody who's going to watch the response video, this is me calling that out before it even happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ballsy <laughs> <laughs> alright here we go what to do is deal with this Jolly Randall cycle thing I want to look at it from two different angles it's important that people understand that these two angles are two aspects of looking at the same thing this is not an either or situation a lot of people because I, sh I show two diagrams and I talk about one diagram, this one being where glucose is the predominant fuel source in the body, and the other one where fats are the predominant fuel source in the body. And people then go away sometimes with the idea that either or situation prevails. No. Both these two charts that I'm going to show you are both in effect at all times simultaneously in the oh, Hold on one sec, Jay. I just want to point something out really quick for everybody. Mm -hmm. So in the video I made uh, going over the fatty acid oxidation, oxidation inhibition of glucose oxidation, I used a paper called the Randall Cycle Revisited, a new head for an old hat. And Bart basically called this paper a crap and an opinion piece, and it's in his description. I just want to point out here that the graphics that he uses to describe the Randall cycle, this graphic right here comes from that same paper. So <laughs> Bart's sources for his description of the Randall cycle, which he clearly didn't read the paper, are are the are those same graphics. I just want to make that clear to everybody. So a paper that is crap and the researchers are morons or whatever, whatever he said, I don't remember the specific phrases because it was irrelevant. He's using their information 
to support his points. He's using their graphics, which is just, I don't know. That's, I don't know. I have nothing else to say with that. I think it kind of stands for itself, but go ahead, Jay. Yeah. The other thing too, and we'll, we'll get into this. So there's two important points from this first clip. One is he's saying that both of these things happen at the same time. We'll explain why that's not the case. The other thing is that he's saying that this is what happens. And we'll see this in the next clip, but just to kind of give you a heads up. So he's saying that this is the process that will happen from glucose oxidation. Now, if you look at the figures from the actual study, this is what they're regarding as what will happen during fat oxidation, and not glucose oxidation. So he's using the incorrect figure. Now, he says that they both, they both happen at the same time. So from his view, it doesn't matter because they're both right in both contexts, which isn't the case. So we'll explain why that's not the case. But again, he seems not to be aware that this is and the we'll wrong see it in the next clip. But yeah, this is the wrong gra- graphic. And he might say, no, it's right. But there's something that becomes very clear when he talks about vegans using one of the graphics. And again, he's using the wrong one to describe what a vegan would want to, to use. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But yeah. uh, just some things to look for. It's just funny because he has he's number one, he's using graphics from a paper that he discredited. And then he's using the he didn't, clearly didn't read the paper. So he's using the graphics incorrectly. Yeah. And of course, he can say the information in the paper is wrong, but the graphics are good. Like he that will probably be a response. But of course, the figures that they're that, you know, these graphics from the paper are there because they represent what the paper is describing. The paper is describing these things and then putting them into a figure in you know, in a way that represents their views. So it normally when you're using a figure from a paper, it means that you agree that the mechanisms that they're citing are accurate. Uh, of course, he could just say he's using it for other purposes. But again, it it's kind of neither here nor there, just kind of a funny uh, aside. Yeah. Body. And then if there is a buildup of citrate inside the mitochondria, because there is a lot of glucose going in there, then that citrate will leak out into the cell cytosol back into the tan area. So now we're up here. And if there's a buildup of citrate in that cell fluid, that will directly deactivate phosphofructokinase 1. It will also deactivate GLUT4. What's going on here? So the important point here, he's saying this is from glucose oxidation. It will increase levels of citrate. That citrate will leak into the cytosol. And that citrate will inhibit phosphofructokinase 1 and GLUT4 hexokinase. We'll explain why this does not happen during glucose metabolism. Instead, you won't, ha- you won't have a built up of citrate during this case. But that's why I included this clip. We'll get to that after. Anything else to mention, Mike or Danny? No, that's pretty much. Okay. EFK1 as well. So basically, too much sugar locks itself out. It's also immediately unlockable as soon as all that excess sugar has run through the system that drags the citrate back down that unlocks the door and lets more sugar in if you eat more sugar though it will lock the door again so hang on you, you weren't listening before so hopefully that makes some good sense there all right so too much sugar will lock out sugar the other thing that also happens is because you've got a whole bunch of acetyl coenzyme a pooling because of all of the sugar going through this pathway here what that will actually do is also that will lock out this long chain fatty acyl coenzyme a molecule from becoming acetyl coenzyme a through allosteric inhibition basically so not only does the sugar lock out sugar it locks out fat as well so now Okay. Yeah. This so is- again, important points here. We'll, we'll get to the, what's actually going on. But so he's saying from sugar oxidation, glucose oxidation increases citrate that blocks its own uptake, which the Randall cycle. And again, this is clearly described by Randall. We'll explain the mechanisms, but very clearly is glucose availability actually increasing glucose oxidation and glucose oxidation inhibiting fat oxidation, not its own oxidation. Now, he did acknowledge that glucose oxidation inhibits fat oxidation. He said that it happens due to a buildup of acetyl-CoA. Uh, it actually happens due to the melanyl-CoA buildup, which we'll explain later. He does, I believe, acknowledge it only when he talks about fatty acid oxidation, although it doesn't happen in that instance, so we'll get there. But these are the points that Bart's making. Uh, just want to make sure that we are clear on his, on his perspective of what, of what happens during glucose metabolism. Yep. And then also, just a quick point, glu- well. It's kind of, there's so much going on here, but the glucose, the inhibition of citrate on phosphor fructose kinase one and then glute four and hexokinase is not a complete inhibition. It doesn't lock the door. And what I mean by that is there's not a complete blockage of glucose influx to the cell from this buildup of citrate. So that is also incorrect. 
Right. Yeah, there's a much stronger inhibition at pyruvate dehydrogenase than at those two, which actually allows for glucose to still be taken up in a in a smaller amount, which has its own implications. But uh, yeah, we won't be digging into that into that as much in this video. But we can if you want, Mike. If you want to cite some stuff, we can. Yeah, go ahead. No, just go to the next one. Okay. Situation. This is Randall cycle situation B, if you like. This is the one that the plant-based supporters, the the vegans, will bang on. This is the one that they will present without presenting what I've just presented to you in terms of what carbohydrates will do to you. And they'll say, here's what happens if you eat a lot of fat, is what they say. Right, so once again, we have the blue, which is outside of the cell. We have the tan, which is inside the cell. And we have the green, which is inside the mitochondria. We have long chain fatty acids in the fluids outside the cell. They are transported. In so here he said he's describing what's going on with fatty acid oxidation and that this is the graph that someone who is suggesting. So if someone's vegan, they're suggesting that you want to be consuming glucose and not fat. And he's saying that this is the graphic that they would show. But again, he's confused here because this is showing that fatty acid oxidation inhibits its own uptake and oxidation. When in reality, what someone who is arguing uh, against fatty acid oxidation would want to be showing is the first graphic, which would say that fatty acid oxidation increases citrate, which would then inhibit the uptake and oxidation of glucose, thereby causing insulin resistance. That is what they would say. We're not arguing for any of these things. We're just saying this is what the random cycle is. But he seems to be quite confused as far as these graphics go, because the other one is the one showing that fatty acid oxidation inhibits glucose oxidation, leading to an insulin resistant state. That is what somebody would be arguing. Yeah. And this graph is this graph is what happens with carbohydrate oxidation inhibiting fatty acid oxidation. This right. is not fatty acid oxidation inhibiting fatty acid oxidation. Fatty acid oxidation doesn't lead to a buildup of citrate that then leads to a buildup of malonyl CoA. Fatty acid oxidation leads to a buildup of citrate that then inhibits phosphofructose kinase and hexokinase. So the like the, again, he's completely mixed up the graphs. He doesn't understand which one is which. And then this also, as we'll get into in a second, when we describe the mechanisms, basically indicates that Bart doesn't understand the actual underlying mechanisms of why why carbohydrate oxidation inhibits fat oxidation. And why fat oxidation inhibits carbohydrate oxidation and, and uptake uh, of both of and uptake and to some extent of both. Yeah. yeah. And we'll get into why that's so important. But just to be clear, like the acetyl CoA and the citrate, these are at, happening at the Krebs cycle. And then that's blocking parts of glycolysis, right? That's the, so the basic idea. Inside well, the gonna, well, we'll go through it after Daniel mm -hmm. can explain what's actually going on. I know it's not like the most clear from from how like because i'm just trying to pull the clips just showing it, like here's it. what bark's saying bart is got saying it. but we'll go through it all after um like in, in detail and explain like how this is all happening how this is happening why this doesn't happen in fatty acid oxidation and why it does in, in glucose oxidation we'll go through it all cool <laughs> all right this is the last clip from this from this nutrition with judy and again mike so you were saying like this is the graph that shows what happens during glucose oxidation so from Bart's view, again, he's saying both of these happen simultaneously with both fat and glucose oxidation. He says it very clearly in the next clip. So from his view, it, I guess it doesn't matter which graphic you show first because both are always happening when both are oxidized, but we'll explain why that's not accurate. ...from carbohydrates. If there is a lot of fat pouring through that cell because you've consumed a great deal of fat, then absolutely you're still going to have a buildup of citrate in the mitochondria because it's the same, it's the same TCA cycle. That citrate will leak out into the cell cytosol exactly as it did before because it's the same citrate that citrate will then be transmuted by an enzyme called acl into acetyl coenzyme a in the cell cytosol which is a build-up molecule in this instance rather than a breakdown molecule that acetyl coenzyme a is then dealt with by another enzyme called acc or acetyl coenzyme a carboxylase i think from memory and that forms a substance called melanol coenzyme A. Now, when that happens, melanol coenzyme A directly blocks out the mitochondria at CPT1, as you can see down here, meaning no more fat can enter the mitochondria. The mitochondria is fully replete with acetyl coenzyme A. Thanks very much. We don't need any more. It also will cause the long chain fatty acyl coenzyme A through a thing called FAS here to start building up triglycerides. 
which then get exported to the blood, transported to the adipose tissue and stored there. Melanol coenzyme A basically is the molecule that tells the cell that it's now in an energetic condition where it needs to store fat for later. So instead of burning it, we're going to build it up into triacylglyceride molecules, export those to the blood. They can go straight off to the adipose tissue. Some of it gets stored, if this is a muscle tissue, some of it will be stored in the muscle, but most of it gets exported. Off we go to basically turn you into a fatty. At the same time, because we have a lot of acetyl coenzyme A from all... Well, that's a fat, fatty acid oxidation turning you into a fatty, right? Yes, that's what he is that's describing. He's saying. saying that <laughs> fatty acid oxidation will lead to a buildup of citrate. That citrate is going to leave the mitochondria, head to the cytosol. It'll be converted to melanin CoA and then inhibit its own oxidation and lead to triglyceride synthesis. We'll explain why this does not happen during most cases of fatty acid oxidation, especially in terms of the Randall cycle. You will not have buildups of melanin CoA. You'll have a buildup of citrate instead. So we'll explain why that's why that's the case. Plus fat, then our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex can't work and we can't produce a bunch of acetyl coenzyme A that way, again through allosteric inhibition. So, just to clear up what he was saying there, because I know I paused it, he was saying that there will be a buildup of acetyl CoA from fatty acid oxidation and that will inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase. And that's how it also inhibits glucose oxidation. It does both, he's saying in this case, or what he just described was via acetyl CoA buildup. He also says it's from allosteric inhibition, but I think there's many more mechanisms of inhibition of pyruvate dehydrogenase than just acetyl-CoA's allosteric inhibition. And that's right, something that I actually discussed in the, that 45 minute video. There's like multiple mechanisms where pyruvate dehydrogenase gets completely shut down. Right, and a lot of that has to do with what goes on at the electron transport chain, which Bart says doesn't actually have anything to do with the Randall cycle. We'll share, that's the last quote we'll share uh, before we dig into what actually, you know, why the electron transport chain is an important part of these mechanisms and also what actually is going on in these mechanisms. Uh, we'll just finish up this clip real, real quick. I don't remember exactly what's at the end here, but I remember it being important. I think he just summarizes glucose inhibits both glucose and fat oxidation and uptake, and fat does the same as well. For what we are now unable to use sugar so much, and of course we get a backup of sugar in that situation, and then that other situation I've just shown you comes into effect and GLUT4 gets locked out, hello insulin resistance. And that's what the vegans will tell you. If you eat a lot of fat, that'll cause insulin resistance without telling you that so will a lot of sugar. Both these situations are in effect at once, at the same time, at all times. So what we've got really to boil all of this down to its simplest form is that a lot of fat will lock out both fat and sugar. A lot of sugar will lock out both fat and sugar. Basically what we've got is too much energy in the blood will be locked out of the cells to protect the cells from damage. Those in Which this is just false. It's not even like there's not even a debate here. These are just incorrect statements. As long as you want to talk like to discuss this from the lens of the Randall cycle. Right. Well, we, we, you don't have to take our word for it being false, right? That's what Bart does every time. Anytime he says something, he goes, oh, that's false, whatever. We'll include Randall's words here on his own cycle and how this is not what happens. And then we'll also go through the uh, mechanisms within these different graphics, including a couple others and describe in, in detail in each step why this is not actually um, the last piece, which is a real short clip, is just him talking about why the electron tran or that the electron transport chain has nothing to do with any of this, and because we're going to explain that it does. Was there anything else you guys wanted to add before we do that? It's a it's a the last clip here. Okay. Through the electron transport chain enzymes, the enzymes pull the electron. Now you want to give us a lecture on the electron transport chain, which is not really anything to do with the Randall cycle and its meaningful physiological effects. It's an irrelevancy, really, and it's a level of detail that is not required for the lay audience, Michael. So that was it there. Just him saying that the electron transport chain is irrelevant to the Randall cycle. Yes. So let's summarize the points that Bart, Bart made in those you know, five, six clips, and then we will go through some citations explaining why that's not the case, and we'll also go through those graphics. This will be kind of the meat of, of what we we'll want to talk through. So his main points, for one, as we said, he's attributing the mechanisms on each figure to the wrong substrate oxidation. So the first one he's just uh, ascribing to glucose oxidation when it was describing what happens during fat oxidation and then vice versa for the other. Uh, he also says it doesn't matter. Both of these happen in both cases. Although he did say, again, the vegans would point to the wrong one from what he said. Like he said, the vegans would point to the first one, even though they would be uh, pointing. Or he said the vegans would point to the second one, even though they would point to the first one. He also said in the beginning that the first one I'll describe is what happens mostly when you're oxidizing, I believe you said, 
uh, glucose, and then the other one's mostly what happens when you oxidize fat. But again, that's reversed. So that's part one. Uh, next thing is he describes the mechanisms here of, of how he, he views the Randall cycle. He basically argued that uh, both sugars and fats lead to a buildup of citrate. That's going to lead to the cytos- uh, move to the cytosol in both cases. That's going to inhibit the enzymes that allow for glucose oxidation and uptake, particularly, particularly phosphofructokinase and hexokinase, which is GLUT4. And then he said also, as the next piece there, that citrate will then be converted to acetyl-CoA and then to malonyl-CoA. And that malonyl-CoA is going to inhibit CPT1, which allows for the uptake of fatty acyl-CoA into the mitochondria. And then the, he also said that that's going to shift toward triglyceride synthesis uh, prior to that. And then the last thing he said was that, again, both sugars and fats are going to lead to an acetyl-CoA buildup, and that is going to again, oxidation of both sugars and fats will lead to that acetyl-CoA buildup and that that's going to inhibit both the conversion from long-chain fatty acyl-CoA to acetyl-CoA and also it's going to inhibit the activity of pyruvate dehydrogenase. So that is how that is the other mechanism that he's citing for how both of them will lock out each other. And uh, we will go through all this with the graphics and, and describe what actually happens. Anything else to add, you guess? No, go ahead, Jay. Okay. So I want to start out before we get into those graphics with a couple of uh, quotes from Randall, basically describing that this is a situation where the oxidation of one inhibits the oxidation and uptake of the other, not that it inhibits itself. So Bart very clearly stated glucose will inhibit the uptake and then oxidation of glucose and fat and fat will inhibit the fat oxidation will inhibit the uptake and oxidation of both fat and glucose. Here's Randall stating that that is not the case and actually that it will just inhibit the opposite uh, substrate. So uh, this is from Randall's 1998 papers uh, titled Regulatory Interactions Between Lipids and Carbohydrates, a Glucose Fatty Acid Cycle After 35 Years. And so Randall states here, uh, he uses... <laughs> he uses What's the first word there, Jay? Interesting diction. Very interesting diction. So he states, competition for respiration between substrates in animal tissues has been known for at least 80 years. The most important interaction, quantitatively, is between glucose and fatty acids. The starting point in 1963 for the so-called glucose fatty acid cycle, this is the Randall cycle, uh, was the realization that the metabolic relationship between glucose and fatty acids is reciprocal and not dependent. This is the important part, of, you know, as far as what I was saying, where he, uh, it states, glucose provision promotes glucose oxidation and glucose and lipid storage and inhibits fatty acid oxidation. So glucose promotes its own oxidation and inhibits fatty acid oxidation. The next line, provision of free fatty acids promotes fatty acid oxidation and storage, inhibits glucose oxidation, and may promote glucose storage if glycogen reserves are incomplete. So then we have provision of free fatty acids promotes fatty acid oxidation and inhibits glucose oxidation. So it states it very, very clearly there. And hold then on, he sta- hold on, before you go on, I just want to ask you a question. So glucose oxidation doesn't block glucose oxidation, right? Right. And then fatty acid oxidation doesn't block fatty acid oxidation, right? Right. And then also, is this, is this a cross inhibition or is it a competition? Uh, Randall states that it's a competition for respiration. He, is, he describes that the glucose fatty acid cycle is within the competition for respiration. He describes that also quite a bit farther down. Oh, okay, okay. I got you. Well, Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I'm not <laughs> going to, to uh, quote all those points where he talks about the... Uh, the competition piece here. Um, yeah. There's one other quote that I meant to share here that states very clearly that the Randall cycle is in fact a situation where you have opposing inhibition of uptake and oxidation and not self inhibition. So at the bottom here of this 1988 paper that we've already referenced, uh, Randall states, the essential components of the glucose fatty acid cycle as originally described and developed were as follows. The relationship between glucose and fatty acid catabolism or oxidation uh, breakdown is reciprocal and not dependent. So again, when he's saying reciprocal here, what it means is that it's opposite. So glucose catabolism is opposing or causing uh, an opposition to fatty acid catabolism and vice versa. Again, they are not causing this effect to their own oxidation or their own uptake. And so here, Randall's just describing the mechanisms, or at least a couple of the mechanisms through which fatty acid and ketone oxidation inhibit uh, glucose metabolism. And they state that effects of, uh, he states that effects of fatty acid and ketone body oxidation 
are mediated by inhibition of phosphofructokinase 1, hexokinase, and pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. The essential mechanism is an increase in the mitochondrial ratio of acetyl-CoA to CoA, which inhibits the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and which leads to inhibition of phosphofructokinase 1 by citrate and of hexokinase by glucose 6-phosphate. So we'll be going into all these mechanisms in a second here. So basically, we have again very clearly stated, especially in that first quote from Randall, that this is a situation where the oxidation of glucose inhibits uptake and utilization of or oxidation of fat, and then vice versa, oxidation of fat inhibits uptake and utilization or oxidation of glucose. It does not inhibit its own oxidation, and same thing for glucose. And this has to do with the regulation between citrate and malonyl CoA, and also the total amount of citrate, as well as uh, some other things that regulate those, including the NAD to NADH ratio, uh, which we'll be digging into in a second, and the availability of CoA and things like that. So these, you know, if you were not aware of all those other mechanisms, you would say, yeah, of course, both of these things will happen at the same time. But I'll pull these graphics up, and and uh, we'll we'll go through it together. So. This one on the left is what's going to largely happen during fat oxidation. The one on the right is what's largely going to happen during glucose oxidation. And as you can see, there's, it looks like there's a lot of similarities here, but the difference, well, there's a couple differences. One is the citrate versus malonyl CoA. So on the right here, in, uh, as a result of glucose oxidation, you're going to have a buildup of malonyl CoA. You won't have a buildup of cytosolic citrate. And vice versa, in the fatty acid oxidation situation, you'll have a buildup of citrate both cytosolic and mitochondrial, which we'll explain, you won't have a buildup of malonyl CoA. And these things have to do with the regulation between citrate and malonyl CoA, as well as how much citrate is being produced inside of the mitochondria. And then we'll also explain how that affects pyruvate dehydrogenase as well. So there should really, in the first graphic on the left, where you have fatty acid oxidation inhibiting carbohydrate oxidation, mm -hmm. those air, the arrow from citrate to acetyl-CoA and then acetyl-CoA to malonyl CoA, those should almost technically have like blocks on them because the citrate yeah. isn't flowing through that pathway with uh, fat oxidation inhibiting carbohydrate oxidation. Right. And I guess that's perhaps that's partly why Bart got confused <laughs> uh, to some extent. I don't know. I but, don't know either. But if you read but, the paper, it's clear. <laughs> yeah, it's clear in the paper. And then on the right, they're highlighted because the citrate. So the right graph is glucose oxidation inhibiting mm -hmm. fatty acid oxidation. And the citrate does flow through to malonyl CoA. Mm -hmm. And this, as well as the mitochondrial mechanisms, are going to be extremely important to understand the, the, the Randall cycle. If you don't know those mechanisms, then you cannot understand why carb oxidation inhibits of a fat oxidation and fat oxidation inhibits carb oxidation. Without those right. pieces, if you just look at these graphs without that, the, that, that information, that context, you will not understand these graphs. You'll get very weird interpretations like fat oxidation inhibits both glucose oxidation and fat oxidation and glucose oxidation inhibits both glucose oxidation and fat oxidation because you're right. just going to see this buildup of citrate and you're going to think, oh, well, both of them build up citrate. So therefore, that buildup of citrate between both of them is what's causing the, the blockage in either direction. But mm -hmm. when you actually put this together, uh, when you actually start to think about this, that doesn't that mechanism doesn't make so much sense if they're both building up citrate and then both inhibiting and then inhibiting the oxidation of both it doesn't i guess you ha would have to rationalize it as like an increase too much energetic influx right. but that's just that's that, that's not what happens in the randall cycle and the and we're we're going to discuss the mechanisms now yeah and cite randall as well saying that because yeah if that did happen it would be completely independent of i mean it, it's just a completely different phenomenon it's not what the Randall cycle is and whether you're reading the paper that these are from or you're reading other papers related to the Randall cycle these mechanisms are all clear like th this isn't just you know if you want to throw out that paper entirely that's fine it's built on all these other papers describing these mechanisms so again as you were saying mike it has we'll talk about the the differences here which have to do with accumulation of citrate or non-accumulation of citrate c uh, conversion between citrate and malonyl coa and vice versa and then also the NAD to NADH ratio, which is not discussed here, and then the availability of, availability of CoA. So we'll get into all those things. The, yeah. the place that all of this starts is at the electron transport chain. So uh, Bart said that the electron transport chain has nothing to do with, with what's going on here. But we're going to start there and explain why that actually causes an accumulation of citrate in, you know, from fatty acid oxidation on uh, this side here. Yeah. That accumulation of citrate is going to be happening due to, first and foremost, effects at the electron transport chain that will not happen during glucose oxidation. 
So you will not have an accumulation of, of mitochondrial citrate here in glucose oxidation. This is, we'll say that this is down, and here this is up. And so we're going to explain that that starts at the electron transport chain and affects a ton of other things. Yeah. So are you going to read Randall quotes first, or would, are we going to I'll go read all the, the quotes? I'll read all the quotes after. Let's just go through all the mechanisms first. Uh, so it's just all, it's all kind of okay. in order, and then we'll go through the quotes where Randall acknowledges and and cites how there's a difference in NAD to NADH ratio between the two, and that's accounting for the buildup of citrate and on and on. Okay. So first thing here again starts at the electron transport chain. So when we have beta oxidation, which is uh, from fatty acids, you're going to have much higher amounts of FADH2 uh, relative to NADH. So the ratio here ends up being about uh, 2.5 times greater than with glucose oxidation if you're talking about a 16 carbon fatty acid. So if you have a 16 carbon fatty acid, you're going to have 250% more FADH2 relative to NADH than if you were oxidizing glucose. Glucose is a very low uh, NADH F to FADH2, sorry, yes, a very low FADH2 to NADH ratio. It's about 0.2, whereas if we're looking at a 16 carbon fatty acid, it's going to be about 0.5, 250% difference. Yeah, I think so. Just to clear, make it a little more easier for people. When you oxidize glucose, you get five NADH to one FADH2. And then when you oxidize uh, fatty acids, you get two uh, NADH to one FADH2. Yeah, but it's also going to depend on the length of the fatty acid, though, how many acetyl CoAs you're creating, because that's where you create more of the FADH2. So it depends on the carbon length. You'd have to look at the exact equivalent amounts of acetyl-CoA, but that's, again, beyond the scope of this article, I'll cite articles describing this, because what the reason why this is important is that both FADH2 and NADH are competing to drop off their electrons to the same electron acceptor, which is ubiquinone. And so when there is a buildup of, oxida of reduced ubiquinone, uh, which is ubiquinol, there's going to be competition between these two. And what happens is for one, NADH is not able to continue offloading as much as efficiently at complex one. So you're going to end up with a buildup of NADH because it can't drop off those electrons as much. The other thing you're going to have is what's called reverse electron transport, which is being shown here, here, where the electrons that are actually being dropped off at complex two end up going backward and released from complex one as reactive oxygen species. So there are two primary effects here that happen during beta oxidation during uh, or as a result of beta oxidation at the electron transport chain one is going to be an increased level of nadh and the second is going to be increased reactive oxygen species that increased level of nadh despite the lower amount of nadh produced during beta oxidation this step is so limiting that that's going to increase the nadh to nad ratio uh, so that and that is again this is something that is not like we're not just making this up. It's not just based on this one paper. I'll cite a handful of papers. This is very well described, talked about a lot, that you have this reverse electron transport and an increase in NADH to NAD ratio or a decrease in NAD to NADH ratio from fatty acid oxidation. From people who are generally in favor of this, they would say, yes, that happens. That's how this is hormetic. It's a good thing, whatever. That's outside of the scope of this video. Uh, we're just talking about what actually happens. Bart was saying that this does not happen. Uh, he, you know, he said that in, in his video critiquing your video, Mike. So uh, that is where everything starts. We have an increased NADH to NAD ratio due to what's going on here at the electron transport chain from uh, beta oxidation relative to glucose oxidation. And then we have an increase in reactive oxygen species. And if we go to the Krebs cycle, we'll see the effects that that has. Yep. Okay. So at the Krebs cycle, as we mentioned, there's a buildup, and so that is going to lead to an increase here of NADH and a relative decrease of NAD+. And so that is going to inhibit this reaction of isocitrate dehydrogenase from occurring right here. So this is going to be occurring much less as a result of fat oxidation. It's going to lead to a buildup of citrate, or of isocitrate and then of citrate. The other thing that happens uh, is that there's an inhibition at aconitase. The connotase of the Krebs cycle enzymes is the most sensitive to reactive oxygen species. So when you have the reverse electron transport going on at the electron transport chain and the production of reactive oxygen species, those are also going to inhibit a connotase. And I'll yep. cite some papers describing that as well in the notes. 
So well, I just did a video on this as well in the uh, about like on the obesity paper where I was okay. talking about ROS inhibition at aconitase because of aconitase sensitivity and then basically leading to a buildup of citrate, which leads to fat formation. Okay, awesome. So that's probably a good video. And I'll cite a handful of other papers as well in the notes uh, here that describe that aconitase is very sensitive to oxidative stress, reactive oxygen species, and therefore there will be inhibition here. And so all of those things are going to lead to a buildup of citrate that is going to happen as a result of fatty acid oxidation. This is not going to happen in the same way as, and as a result of as a result of glucose oxidation. You won't have this uh, ratio going on with the NAD to NADH ratio where the NADH is increased. So you won't have inhibition here, and you won't have the reactive oxygen species via uh, reverse electron transport. So you won't have the inhibition at aconitase. So you won't have the buildup of mitochondrial citrate. Now, going back to those other figures, we can see what happens when there's a buildup of mitochondrial citrate. Uh, before you go, Jay, just sure. one other thing to point out is that pruvate dehydrogenase also requires NAD for the reaction to occur. Mm -hmm. So if you have a buildup of NADH relative to NAD, you can also get a shutdown at pruvate dehydrogenase complex mm -hmm. for everyone out there. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is that NADH has a buildup of NADH upregulates pruvate dehydrogenase kinase, which is an enzyme that also further shuts down pruvate dehydrogenase complex. So you have... The acetyl-CoA buildup shuts down pruvate dehydrogenase. The buildup of NADH shuts down pruvate dehydrogenase. And then an upregulation of pruvate dehydrogenase uh, kinase shuts down pruvate dehydrogenase, which is why I think you see this massive block on pruvate dehydrogenase from, the, from uh, fatty acid oxidation. So you have multiple blocks. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is that one of the papers that you and I were actually discussing was showing that in like a diabetic uh, in cell culture and diabetic rats, diabetic rat hearts, they actually have a buildup of malate, a buildup of uh, isocitrate, and it's because the excess fatty acid oxidation at the at these cells electron transport chain is leading to a buildup of NADH, and there's not enough NAD to allow the these reactions to occur effectively. The reason I want to, and we can cite that paper, but the reason I want to discuss that is because Bart was basically saying in one of the videos, number one, that that's irrelevant, but then number two, that you always have an, all the NAD that you need, something along those lines. So um, with fatty acid oxidation, you actually don't, you wind up leading to a buildup of the NADH. And I guess the last piece as well is that the ROS, so the other, the cell can upregulate an uncoupling protein when you have large amount of ROS production. And I don't, if you, well, I, I kind of discussed this in that video where I went over it, but the ROS, uh, the uncoupling protein will bind into the mitochondrial membrane and it will uh, basically allow the H plus ions to dissipate. And so your ROS generation gets decreased, but now you have decreased ATP production. So you're either, either if you have a upregulation of ROS, you can get a shutdown of aconitase, which then can lead to a build of a citrate, or you can have a, a decreased efficiency of energy production because you're dissipating the gradient that you're creating. So in either state with the fatty acid oxidation, you're, cre like you're creating issues uh, in multiple different levels to some extent. So I just wanted to, I pointed those out in the other video, um, but I also think it's important to point out here overall. Sure. Yeah. And the, yeah, those are important aspects in terms of fatty acid oxidation. They won't actually be the, that last part there isn't actually involved in the inhibition of glucose uptake or, or glucose oxidation. Yeah. Um, but as you were saying earlier, so because of this buildup of citrate, you will also have a buildup of acetyl-CoA. And again, these are things that happen only as a result of, as a result of, again, when we're talking about normal fatty acid oxidation, they don't happen as a result of normal glucose oxidation. We'll see that in the quotes that we have describing buildups of citrate, elevated acetyl-CoA to CoA, uh, elevated NADH to NAD, these are features just of fatty acid oxidation. So again, as you were saying, Mike, if someone wasn't aware of all these mechanisms, they would say, of course, these things happen in both cases. But if someone was aware of these details here, then they would understand that this is only a function of fatty acid oxidation inhibiting glucose oxidation. This does not happen if you're oxidizing glucose and therefore glucose oxidation would not inhibit its own oxidation. The other thing you mentioned as well, as you said, pyruvate dehydrogenase also relies on uh, NAD. So by reducing the NAD availability relative to NADH, it's going to inhibit the activity uh, here of pyruvate dehydrogenase, and that's also going to lead to a buildup of, of pyruvate. So uh, yeah, the buildup of acetyl-CoA and 
shift in NAD to NADH ratio will cause this to happen. Again, only as a feature of fatty acid oxidation, not normal glucose oxidation. So we have this buildup of citrate. That's going to head into the cytosol. And so I'm going to share the two graphs again, uh, showing this state. I'm actually just going to share the graph that's showing what happens during, uh, that's during fatty glucose. acids. Yeah, oxidation. Yeah. So this is that graph. And so we just talked about how there's a buildup of citrate here as a result of fatty acid oxidation, and also how there's an inhibition at pyruvate dehydrogenase, not just because of the ACL-CoA, but also the NAD to NADH ratio being lower. Now, this citrate will leave the mitochondria and end up in the cytosol. And you, have, you have elevated levels of citrate, and those are going to inhibit pyruvate, uh, for, uh, sorry, phosphofructokinase, as well as GLUT4, which is hexokinase. Now, there is another important point here that we were alluding to, which is that this citrate conversion to ACL-CoA and, and conversion to malonyl-CoA is going to be inhibited. These, these, the citrate is not going to be heading in that direction. And the reason for that is two, or you could even say three fold. So the first of these things, which is happening during fatty acid oxidation, occurs here on the right, where when you have the long chain fatty acid getting converted to the long chain acyl-CoA, and that requires a CoA uh, molecule. Yes. You may want to pull up both pictures, Jake. It, um, so you can see the enzyme that you're going to talk about in a second. Uh, okay, well, I'm, I'll go to that one after. I think this will be okay. fine. But if it's not clear, I'll try to draw them in. But if it's not clear, then I'll go okay. to that other one. So that CoA has to go in here. And so when you're oxidizing fatty acids, you end up with the depletion of this CoA due to this reaction. Now, that same CoA is needed in order to convert that or in order to for this first enzyme which is atp citrate lyase to have uh to function so you need to have another coa over uh, too many arrows and over here and so that coa is needed to go through this enzyme which is atp citrate lyase and what that produces is acetyl coa and then oxaloacetate so this is going to produce oxaloacetate over here. But you need that CoA. So because there's a depletion of CoA in the state, the ATP citrate lyase, which converts citrate to acetyl-CoA, is going to be inhibited. This step is going to be inhibited by the lack of CoA. And that CoA is the reason you have a lack of CoA at the cytosol is because that CoA is being added to the long chain fatty acids or the long right. chain fatty acid tails on the right so that they can then move in order for them to move into the mitochondria, they need to have the CoA group added. So it's depleting the the coas as they're moving in through through the cell to the mitochondria exactly so that's the first reason why you're not going to have a citrate uh toward acetyl coa the other reason would have to do with some hormonal effects so the uh, the main thing that's going to stimulate this conversion not the main thing but one thing that will stimulate this conversion this activity of atp citrate lyase is insulin which will generally be low if you're oxidizing fatty acids and the thing that will inhibit that activity and shift it more towards citrate will be glucagon. And so you'll tend to lean toward glucagon over insulin, but typically a higher glucagon to insulin ratio in the situation of fatty acid oxidation. So it's another step of regulation here. And then the last step has to do with the conversion from acetyl-CoA to malonyl-CoA, which is done by acetyl-CoA carboxylase. And that step during uh, fatty acid oxidation tends to not be activated. And that's because the main thing that's going to uh, inhibit that step is going to be AMP kinase. And normally there is some activity of AMP kinase going on when you have fatty acid oxidation. So you're not inhibiting this step like you would be, uh, or sorry, so you're not stimulating this step like you would be during glucose oxidation. Yeah. So when you're, when you're oxidizing fatty acids, you have an upregulation of AMPK that blocks the conversion of acetyl CoA to malonyl CoA. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll write that in here so it's yeah. clear. So as a recap, when you have uh, insulin, insulin stimulates the enzyme ATP citrate lyase to convert citrate to acetyl CoA, whereas the opposite hormone, glucagon, basically blocks to some extent the enzyme ATP citrate lyase that converts citrate to acetyl CoA in a state of large amount of fatty acid oxidation, such as a low carb diet, such as diabetes type 2, such as starvation you have an increase in glucagon because you don't have exogenous carbohydrate coming in to a large extent, or you have dysregulation of, the, of insulin sensitivity 
and and carbohydrate uh, oxidation, things along those lines, which will push the cell towards building up citrate because the enzyme that converts citrate to acetyl-CoA gets blocked by the, some of these adaptive hormones and by the fatty acid oxidation stealing all of the CoA in the cell. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. And uh, again, with fatty acid oxidation, you tend to have the presence of AMP kinase, which will inhibit the acetyl-CoA carboxylase step. But there are also other mechanisms that go on during fatty acid oxidation that inhibit, as we described a few of them, that inhibit this conversion independent of that AMP kinase. It's just kind of an extra regula- regulatory step here. So in, con- like in conclusion here, in terms of the citrate piece, we're going to see a buildup of citrate here, specifically in terms of fatty acid oxidation. And we will not see that conversion to acetyl-CoA into malonyl-CoA. Again, in Bart's video, he says that that happens during fatty acid oxidation. It does not tend to happen during normal fatty acid oxidation because of the regulation at these different enzymes. Yep. So the, is there anything else to cover in terms of the fatty acid oxidation inhibition of glycolysis and glucose uptake? No, I think you, I think you, well, I guess this would be the point where we can kind of mention that the blockage of pruvate dehydrogenase is almost complete, right? That's a, we've got some quotes and stuff on that later. Let's okay. That's fine. Yeah. Let's just keep it at the mechanisms here and then we'll go through the, the glucose oxidation one next and explain the opposite situation. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to share what happens. So in contrast to this, I'll share what happens, what goes on uh, with glucose oxidation. So with glucose oxidation, you're not going to see those same mechanisms. You're not going to see a buildup of citrate. You're not going to see an elevated mitochondrial acetyl-CoA to CoA. Again, both of those resulted from what happened at the electron transport chain. And you're not going to have the same inhibition of pyruvate dehydrogenase. And in the cytosol, you're not going to have a buildup of citrate inhibiting phosphofructokinase and hexokinase or GLUT4. Instead, what you are going to have is much lower amounts of citrate. And the citrate that does exist in the cytosol is going to be converted toward melanocoa. And we just kind of explained some of the reasons for this when we were talking about fat oxidation. But the reason why it goes in this direction and citrate does not build up has to do with regulation at each of these enzymes. So for one, there is not a lack of CoA in this uh, situation. So there's not that inhibition step at ATP citrate lyase, which was happening in the other state. So that's not inhibited by the CoA. The other thing is that insulin is going to stimulate ACL as well. And so that's also going to increase that, uh, the activity of that step. Whereas you're going to typically have lower glucagon, so you're not going to have that inhibition at that step. The other thing is you're typically going to have low AMP kinase, and that AMP kinase, as we were talking about before, inhibits ACC. So you're not going to have that inhibition of ACC, acetyl-CoA carboxylase, by AMP kinase during a safe glucose oxidation. So in other words, this citrate heading to malonyl-CoA is free. It's totally free to do that. There's nothing blocking those steps. And in fact, it's stimulated if you're considering insulin here. So you're not going to have a buildup of citrate. We'll have a citation describing that there is way less citrate in context of glucose oxidation relative to fat oxidation. And so this is why glucose oxidation does not inhibit its own uh, glycolytic enzymes, its own oxidation, and it also doesn't inhibit its own uptake, but rather inhibits the uptake and oxidation of fat. The other thing to mention here is that the reason that you don't have or you have enough CoA is because you're not having a large influx of fatty acids into the cell when you're oxidizing the carbohydrate. Right. So you're not having the depletion of CoA, so that's not inhibiting ACL, right? And then the other thing you're saying, you don't have the buildup of acetyl-CoA in the mitochondria, and that's because you're free to keep going through the Krebs cycle. You aren't limited by either NAD to NADH ratios or the production of reactive oxygen species through reverse electron transport. So there's nothing causing the buildup of acetyl-CoA there uh, in normal functional glucose oxidation. Yeah. If anything, it's, it's stimulating more glucose oxidation. Right. And in the, in the paper that I discussed on the inhibition of fatty acid oxidation by um, the inhibition of glucose oxidation by fatty acid oxidation, in the mouse models that I talked about at the end, when you upregulate pruvate dehydrogenase function, you actually get a lowered blood sugar to some extent because the, the, um, the glucose is allowed to continually move through the Krebs cycle and produce energy because you don't have these different blocks. And that was something that they were showing with the mice, which I think Bart said was irrelevant because it's in mice, but (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Uh, So that's, again, I think those were the key differences. And now I'll cite a few things that are supporting this from Randall 
and Randall's papers himself, uh, Randall himself and his papers. And in his papers, he's mostly describing a few things that happened during the oxidation of fatty acids. So he's mostly describing the elevated acetyl-CoA to CoA. He's mostly describing the elevated citrate. He also describes the effect on the NAD to NADH ratio. Uh, he also describes the effects of malonyl-CoA uh, inhibiting, uh, inhibiting fat uptake and oxidation, which we just showed. He, there are a few other things as far as the mechanisms between citrate and malonyl-CoA that he doesn't discuss. And so we'll cite other papers in the notes that will, uh, you know, in the description that deal with those things. Uh, and also same with the reverse electron transport and the effects between the FADH2 to NADH ratio affecting the NAD to NADH ratio. But I'll cite some papers here or we'll look at some quotes from Randall describing all of these things. All right, so we're going to start out with the same paper of Randall's from 1998. So that first quote there was Randall describing the blockage of glucose oxidation by fatty acid oxidation. Right. This was the one where he was talking about the competition piece and everything. Yeah. And then this one's going to be glucose oxidation inhibiting fatty acid oxidation. Right. So here, yeah. So this is the point where he explains that malonyl-CoA, as we described, will be increased during glucose oxidation and will inhibit fatty acid oxidation. So he says malonyl-CoA inhibition of fatty acid oxidation may be expected to contribute to the switch to pyruvate oxidation and hence possibly to increase ATP to ADP ratio. Conversely, inhibition of acetyl-CoA carboxylase gene expression might be expected to facil facilitate fatty acid oxidation at the expense of glucose oxidation and thus blunt the insulin secretory response to glucose. So again, just very clear malonyl-CoA inhibition of fatty acid oxidation uh, contributing to the switch. Anything else you want to add there, Mike? No, I think it's like pretty clear from what Randall's saying. Okay. So the next I would part, like to add in that my chickens uh, really like sugared milk, and that's what I fed them, and they really enjoy it. Okay, carry on, <laughs> Danny. You're not supposed to be pouring sh glucose down your gullet. Don't you know what that'll do to those poor chickens? <laughs> that's true. I haven't thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> so in this next quote, he describes uh, Randall describes how fat, fatty acid oxidation and ketone oxidation decrease the NAD to NADH ratio and increase the ACOA to acetyl-CoA to CoA ratio. So he says, rapid effects of fatty acids and ketone body oxidation to promote phosphorylation and inactivation of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex are mediated by increased mitochondrial ratios of acetyl-CoA to CoA and of NADH to NAD+. This is what we described in those previous graphics, and Randall is in agreement with those things. Or was. Yes. yes. So, so basically, the, if you disagree with this, you have to disagree with Randall. Yeah. <laughs> R.I.P. Randall. Yeah. Yeah. So the next point we'll be discussing uh, the buildup of citrate, which Randall talks about in his 1967 paper titled The Influence of Magnesium Ions and Other Bivalent Metal Ions on the Econotase Equilibrium and Its Bearing and on the Binding of Magnesium Ions by Citrate in Rat Heart. Again, a lot of the Randall cycle information was determined based on looking at what's going on in rat heart mitochondria and whatnot. All that was then replicated and, and shown in humans as well. So, uh, yeah, it's there's the physiology is very similar. They've got the same Krebs cycle going on in their mitochondria. Of course, there are small differences depending on what enzyme you're looking at and what tissue. Just like there are there are some in humans as well. There's differences between humans and animals. Of course, those things are all accounted for in the papers that go in to describe uh, what exactly is happening in terms of the random cycle in humans. So. Randall states here that when hearts from normal rats are perfused with the medium with medium containing glucose and insulin, the citrate to isocitrate concentration is reported to be between 7.8 to 1 and 11 to 1. The ratio is increased in hearts from aloxan diabetic rats or in hearts from normal rats perfused with ketone bodies or fatty acids to 15 to 1. So elevations of citrate to isocitrate ratio nearly doubling, a uh, little bit less than doubling when fatty acids or ketones are uh, used by the mitochondria of normal rats compared to uh, compared to using glucose. And again, this is in rat mitochondria. It's corroborated elsewhere as well. And uh, these are, again, just describing enzyme changes that happen during fat and glucose oxidation, which are very parallel between humans and rats. So just a quick summary, when you add fats to, to I guess, the mito, when you add fats to uh, the heart of rats 
or you or to a perfusion of the rat's hearts, you basically see a change in the amount of citrate to isocitrate, the mm-hmm. ratio. And that's important because citrate is converted through the enzyme uh, aconitase to um, isocitrate. So what this is showing here is it's showing the importance of that NADH to NAD ratio because that that uh, that aconitase enzyme or some of the other enzymes inside the uh, the Krebs cycle would be inhibited by a high amount of NADH because they won't have adequate amount of NAD. And that's why the citrate to isocitrate ratio becomes so important. Right. So you're seeing a buildup of isocitrate from the inhibition of isocitrate dehydrogenase due to the shift in NAD to NADH ratio. And that is all, that's going to also lead to a buildup of citrate. Uh, as you were saying, Mike, the, especially looking at the ratios here, that's largely related to a connotation, at least in part. And we also talked about how that will be inhibited by reactive oxygen species, which will also lead to the shift here. But this is just talking about the ratios. This isn't actually talking about the amount of citrate and how much the citrate itself is building up. But if we look at this Bowman paper from 1966, it explains that citrate builds up quite a bit relative uh, and, you know, from fat oxidation relative to glucose oxidation. So this is a Bowman. This is that Bowman paper from 1966, and it's uh, the title is "Effects of Diabetes, Fatty Acids, and Ketone Bodies on Tricarboxylic Acid Cycle Metabolism in the Perfused Rat Heart." And so you see here, this is with perfusion with uh, with glucose, and we're looking at citrate levels. We've got 1.1, 0.8, 1.8. 1. When you average these together and weight them based on the number of trials. You're looking at about 1.18 on average uh, in this situation. And then later, so this is again, they're giving the mitochondria glucose. This is the amount of citrate you see. And then later, you see what happens when they give octanoate, which is a fatty acid, to heart mitochondria. And you see a much higher level of citrate. You see 4.5. That's just with octanoate here and a much lower amount as well, just two millimolars. So you're seeing considerably higher levels of citrate, about four times with octanoate versus glucose. And he has a quote describing this here. He says, nevertheless, even in these hearts, the citrate level was four to five times as high in hearts perfused with or without glucose and no octanoate. The results indicate that glucose is not required as a substrate for the fatty acid fatty acid effect on citrate. So showing that fatty acids alone will lead to this large buildup of citrate considerably more than if you're oxidizing glucose. And we described that happening in, uh, in those graphics. Yep. And that's, again, important because it's related to the ROS generation and the NADH to NAD ratios of fatty acid oxidation versus glucose oxidation. Um, I don't know if you want to pull up the Krebs cycle just so they can see why, like what that is, or if you want to just keep going. Yeah, I, I don't have any other uh, quotes to share regarding this. I think, yeah, we, you know, we already went through those mechanisms, right? This is talking about why from uh, fatty acid oxidation, you have a buildup of citrate here. That's, that's what we're getting at with that last quote. And as you were saying, Mike, it's happening as a result of what's going on first at the electron transport chain, but then at the Krebs cycle, where you're ending up with a buildup of citrate here. That's due to inhibition here due to a low NAD to NADH ratio. It's also due to inhibition here due, due to reactive oxygen species. And so that's what yep. those are those contributors to buildups of citrate from fat oxidation. And the relevance of this overall is showing just how important the, elect- the, the electron transport chain ratios of NADH to FADH2 are in determining which substrate is oxidized. And this puts it into the context, the extreme importance of the Randall cycle from the perspective of what substrate is being oxidized. It's not necessarily about what's in the blood and it's not necessarily about what's going on in the cytosol. They are involved, but the core mechanisms to look at here are what's going on in terms of the oxidation of glucose versus fatty acids and then how those things back up through the cytosol into the blood. And so then if you don't know these mechanisms, then you won't be able to get, it's like a domino effect, right? If you don't understand this first key point here about what's going on in the electron transport chain, what's going on with NADH to FADH2 ratios, then, and then some of the enzymatic functions in the cytosol, then you won't understand what's going on with a backup to the bloodstream, et cetera, or, or some of the pathways or understandings of what's going on in the cytosol as well. So you really need to understand these key points. So the NADH and FADH2 ratios, as we saw in, in Bart's quote, they're not irrelevant. And it's not just something that, you know, is only for people who are trying to like academics who are trying to learn this stuff. It's for people who are interested in understanding a Randall cycle at all. And even lay people, whatever your credentials are, the credentials I think are irrelevant. 
Of course. Well, and it's also the the huge point that you're also getting at, Mike, is these reasons that we're describing are the are the reasons why these two situations don't both happen at the same time. They aren't A and B. They aren't happening simultaneously. One is specifically happening under the conditions of normal glucose oxidation. The other is specifically happening under the normal conditions of fatty acid oxidation. Of course, on the right here, we have the fatty acids. On the left, we have the glucose oxidation. And, and those, all these mechanisms, these differences are key to understanding that. As, you know, and we'll, we'll move on from this point and talk about the next topic here. But if that's why we spent the time you know, explaining all of them, because otherwise, yeah, of course, you're going to think citrate's going to go to malnucoa in either case. Uh, and then, of course, both of these cases are always going to be true. And glucose blocks fat and glucose and fat blocks fat and glucose as well. And that's not what's happening. And that's not what Randall has said is happening. He's explained, he's cited all the same mechanisms minus a few. And uh, yeah, it's very clear. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. What was the last mechanism that you wanted to discuss? So the last thing I wanted to discuss involved another clipper tube. This was talking about the states when the Randall cycle is activated. And so, again, this is directly related to these other things and also related to what you were saying before, Mike, as far as what is determining the Randall cycle. Is it substrate in the cytosol? Is it substrate in the blood? Or is it what's actually being oxidized? And so this was, there was a couple of, of quotes that we were talking about from Bart's original video on uh, des describing what Paul was wrong about, where he was talking about hyperglycemia activating the Randall cycle, ketosis not activating the Randall cycle, it's deactivated in that state. And those things are important to know are not accurate uh, in the way that he states them. So I was going to talk about those and, and have that kind of be the last piece that we wrap up with. In our initial bioenergetic response, this is actually something that Danny brought up, where Danny was talking about if you're under a stress state or you're in a starvation state or a fasting state or anything like that, you you will have fat, like fatty acid oxidation occurring largely or more than glucose oxidation on a whole body level, with some minor exceptions to certain organs, and that's what like and that's functioning through the Randall effect and it's not just based on eating this is something that you, you brought up very specifically danny so and we're going to get gonna, into that right now i don't have uh, i'm not a pro professor though so i'm going to defer to bart on this <laughs> <laughs> yeah as we all should <laughs> <laughs> all right so we'll go through these last two uh, quotes or clips from from bart discussing this and then we'll explain what would actually be happening in terms of the randall cycle in these situations and we'll cite a couple of of uh, quotes from Randall also describing what would happen. And, uh, and then there's, a, there's actually a, a third clip that I'd like to get to as well, where, uh, again, it's talking about how the activation of the Randall cycle only happens if there's a mix of fat and carbs. And I'd like to explain why that's not the case. It yeah. directly ties in with these other ones. So let's get through these clips. So this is what the Randall cycle does, according to Bart. What the Randall cycle does is when the level of sugar in the blood is elevated above the resting homeostatic set point, it locks the doors on the cells to the influx of still further glucose. It, can, it controls the concentration of glucose in the cells chemistry i think most of the time all right so oh, there, okay. what's oh, that oh you stopped it okay yeah yeah i was pausing it i was just going to say what we basically have there just to summarize the point he's saying that in a state where there's excess glucose in the blood the the uh randall cycle is going to allow for the blocking of uptake of glucose and we'll explain why the, the opposite is true uh, and then we'll go on to this next uh, very related quote or clip I think most of the time you don't want to be in ketosis. You want your muscles to be insulin sensitive. <sighs> Being in ketosis does not mean that you are not insulin sensitive. If anything, Paul, being in ketosis will lead you to a higher likelihood of being more insulin sensitive. Because if you are in ketosis, it means your blood sugar level is near baseline. And as such, the Randall cycle will be entirely deactivated and your sensitivity to insulin will be at its highest at that time. Goodness sake. You want the... <laughs> oh, right. man. So what we have, one is he's saying hyperglycemia will activate the Randall cycle and lock the doors to further glucose. 
The second one is saying very low blood sugar, like in a state of ketosis, will deactivate the Randall cycle. And we won't touch on the insulin sensitivity resistance piece that's outside of the scope of this video where we're just talking about what exactly is the Randall cycle and when is it or is it not activated. So I think the first thing just to get clear on is what is meant by activation. Now, the Randall cycle is something that will be, quote, activated, will be in effect. The ph phenomenon will be occurring anytime glucose is being oxidized or fat is being oxidized, which is probably going to be, mo or ketones are oxidized. You know, pretty much any substrate being oxidized will lead to regulation of the oxidation and uptake of other substrates. And so Bart is making it sound as though this is actually not the case. And instead, this is determined, the Randall cycle activation is determined by what's going on in the blood, specifically in terms of glucose and no other substrate, right? Because in ketosis, he's saying it's going to be deactivated because glucose is low. No, you know, no comment about what would happen in terms of fatty acids levels and triglyceride levels and those affecting the Randall cycle as well. And so as we've already described, the Randall cycle, as I was saying, is in effect during glucose oxidation, during fat oxidation. What's going on in the blood will affect those things, but is not the only thing that affects those things. So you can have high glucose in the blood and be oxidizing glucose, you can have high glucose in the blood and, be, and a cell could be oxidizing fat. Regardless of what's going on in the blood, the Randall cycle will be in effect in any cell that is oxidizing glucose, fat, ketones, or other substrates. Any cell that is oxidizing substrate, period, right. is the Randall effect is in effect. It's not off. Right. And so that, again, same thing would be going on in ketosis. In that case, someone is largely relying on fatty acid oxidation. And any of those cells that are relying on fatty acid oxidation, the Randall cycle will absolutely be, quote, activated, will be in effect that you can observe the phenomenon because that fatty acid oxidation is going to be inhibiting the uptake and usage of glucose. Exactly. So, by the mechanisms we described. <laughs> by the mechanisms we described, and we'll explain, I'll cite two things right now from Randall himself saying that that's the case. So the first was actually a quote that we had already uh, gone over, I believe, which was from Randall's 1998 paper. And yeah, so just going to this last part here, he states that glucose provision, you could consider this as an elevation in glycemia and in, in blood glucose, promotes glucose oxidation and glucose and lipid storage and inhibits fatty acid oxidation. So Bart was saying in that first one that hyperglycemia is going to inhibit the uptake and oxidation of glucose. But actually, Randall says it right here very clearly that it promotes those things. And, uh, and then the opposite, of course, in the case which you would have this during ketosis, uh, which is the provision of free fatty acids. But he actually has a separate quote in his 1988 paper, again, one that we had already uh, looked at, describing that in a state of ketosis, the Randall cycle is active. It is having a role. So he says it here in terms of both starvation and a high fat diet. So he says that the oxidation of glucose is decreased by starvation, diabetes, high fat diet, oxidation of lipid fuels, and experimental forms of, of obesity. This is a feature of the Randall cycle. He says it again down here, where he states that increased oxidation of lipid fuels as a result of increased lipolysis. This, of course, is something, and he also says fatty acids and or, and ketone or ketones. Bodies. So both right. of those. Yeah. So this is the state that would be going on during ketosis. He said this is undoubtedly one factor leading to decreased percentage of active pyruvate dehydrogenase in tissues in starvation and diabetes against starvation, just like fasting. And he, and again, Bart has mentioned many times that if you don't have provision of substrate, if you're not eating, the Randall cycle won't be in effect. But Randall is stating that his cycle is absolutely in effect in those states. Starvation, diabetes, uh, increased oxidation of lipids. Including and, uh, ketones. Mm -hmm. Those lipid including and ketone, ketone oxidation. Because he, the reason I bring that up is because Bart does state that ketone oxidation is different than lipid oxidation, which it is to some extent, of course. As, as you and I discussed. But it's showing that this is happening with both of those. Right. The Randall cycle is absolutely in effect. If you want to say it's activated, that's fine too. But it is, however you want to phrase it, it is going on. Anytime some substrate is being oxidized by any cell. And obviously that is happening in ketosis, uh, despite uh, Paul saying, or sorry, despite Bart saying that it does not, and that is deactivated. So that was, oh, the, so the last piece I did want to mention was a quick clip, again, where Bart is describing that this is going to happen if there's a substrate that's a mix of fat and carbs, uh, as opposed to, again, as we're saying, where whether it's a carb only, fat only, mixed meal, carbs and fats, no meal at all. If you're starving, Randall cycle will be activated in all of those cases and just dependent on what substrate is being oxidized at the cell. Just before you go, Jay, I do want to mention something pretty quickly here that the, I think 
based on my interpretation of what Bart's saying, I think he's confusing because what he does have a tangent on diabetes where he's just saying that it's just hyperglycemia. But what I think Bart doesn't understand is that diabetes and Randall just said it, but diabetes is characterized by fatty acid oxidation and then an increase in citrate to isocitrate, which would indicate changes in NADH to NAD to NAD ratios. Um, and then obesity is also characterized by those states. So the, all, and then the other thing, and I pointed this out in a comment section in one of my videos, but diabetes and, and impaired glucose tolerance are characterized not only by insulin resistance, but are also characterized by a, a state of increased glucagon and gluconeogenesis. So you have a combination of increased glucose output by the liver with a subsequent increase in uh, or decrease in the ability of cells to effectively take up that glucose and oxidize it. And both of these states are characterized by, or, or this state is involved, is a mechanism involved in the insulin resistance and what's going on is this increased fatty acid oxidation, which then it doesn't necessarily lock the door, but it decreases glucose flux into the cell. And then also decreases the oxidation of glucose by shutting down pervade dehydrogenase and lowering glycolytic flux. So I think like it's very easy to get there's a, there's a difference between having carbohydrate, like eating carbohydrate and then having your blood sugar elevate. And then your cells to, to some extent in normal people, it's not going to be a large elevation. And then your cells based your liver shutting down gluconeogenesis to some extent, and then your cells taking up that glucose and oxidizing it versus being in a pathological metabolic state where even when you take in glucose, gluconeogenesis isn't shut down. And then also uh, the cells aren't able to adequately take up the glucose that is that is circulating. And again, this it's really important to understand that the Randall cycle in this situation is a function of what's being oxidized inside the mitochondria. Because if you don't understand that perspective, then you won't understand why these like why would the, these certain things are happening in these situations. So I think that that's an important context for some of like or at least from my interpretation of what Bart is saying um overall so yeah go ahead all right last clip here anytime there is vastly more energy in the blood than is needed at that time by the cells of the body if the energy stores in that blood are significantly even if there is a mixture of carbs and fats there, then the Randall cycle will be activated. In other words, every single time you eat a meal which is mixed macronutrient in terms of fats and carbohydrates, in the post-absorbative state, once you have absorbed that food, for at least a goodly number of hours after that meal, you will absolutely experience Randall cycle activation. Until such time, as the level of substrates in your blood drops below a level that significantly activates the Randall cycle in you. There are set points, there is a hysteresis on that. It is part of an integrated system of the body as a whole, yes. And you need to understand that. So, again, very parallel. Again, just the idea that you need to have excess substrate and it needs to be mixed. He said, if those things happen, I guess he didn't exclude all the other possibilities, but he was saying, if those things happen with the assumption that if those things don't happen, uh, the Randall cycle will be, you know, if those things happen, the Randall cycle will be activated. If it's not, it won't. And as we were saying, as we just cited from Randall himself, whether you're in starvation, whether it's the provision of glucose, whether it's the provision of fatty acids, individually, those are all going to be cases where you're going to have Randall cycle activation. Of course, but that's because anytime substrate is being oxidized, it, there's going to be activity of the Randall cycle where it's going to inhibit the uptake and oxidation of the opposite substrate to some extent. And uh, yeah, it's going to depend on, on how much oxidation is happening and all sorts of other criteria determining, you know, uptake and usage of these fuels. But again, it's centered around what is being oxidized, whether again, it's carb only meal, fat only meal, mixed meal, no meal at all, fasting, whatever it is, there's going to be Randall cycle act, quote activation anytime a substrate is being oxidized by a cell. Yeah. So in a starvation state or a low carb diet, you would just be predominating with fatty acid oxidation, right. which is when what Paul was alluding to in his video, 
was that when you're predominating with fatty acid oxidation, you're going to have an inhibition of glucose oxidation because of the Randall effect. Right. Not every cell, not every tissue, you know, right? I mean, it just yeah. in the tissues that are oxidizing fats, which will be way more in ketosis, those tissues are going, or at least the cells within those tissues, again, depending on the percentages, regional differences, all of that, any of those cells that are, in, you know, that are oxidizing fatty acids will be inhibited in terms of the uptake and, and oxidation of glucose, which, as you're saying, Mike, will happen in those states. Yeah. So you would actually be less insulin sensitive in a high fat starvation or uh, ketogenic diet type of state, low carb type of state. <laughs> Mike, the only construct that is real is the Randall cycle. We know that <laughs> insulin sensitivity is just a construct that's not real. Yes. But <laughs> the Randall cycle is also a construct as per Bart. Right. But this one is a real construct, whereas insulin sensitivity is a false construct. I'm still don't waiting even have to say that. Just say it's a construct. Then, then everyone yeah, knows. It's, yeah, because the construct is, a, is equal Apparently, with fantasy. false. Yes. Yeah. And then we're just still waiting for the piece of kit that measures the Randall cycle. Right. Yes. Where's your kit to me measure your Randall cycle? <laughs> if you can't measure it, then it can't exist. If you can't you know, measure how many Randall cycles are in your blood, how are you possibly <laughs> going to argue that it exists without using, you know, the proxy of what's going on with the metabolic machinery in the cell, just like you would with insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity, right? Looking at the actual amount of insulin, the amount of glucose, how much is being taken up, used, how the cells are responding, and uh, using those proxies of metabolic machinery <laughs> to uh, determine whether that phenomenon is occurring, whether that idea or concept is, is occurring, uh, just like the Randall cycle, which is a concept, not metabolic machinery. You know, of course, one that describes what happens with metabolic machinery, just like many other physiological concepts. That was a huge word salad. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I get it. We're just in case anybody's not aware, we're being sarcastic because of some of the statements in some of Bart's videos of calling insulin resistance uh, a construct. And then at one point, he also calls the Randall cycle a construct. But when he's discussing insulin resistance, it's assumed that a construct means that it that doesn't exist. Whereas with the Randall cycle, when you call it a construct, he then qualifies it that it is real. And then he further goes on to imply that insulin resistance doesn't exist because you can't measure it. But with the Randall cycle, like you also would have to use a large amount of proxy markers like citrate to isocitrate ratios and things like that to measure Randall cycle effect, which is what Randall did. Um, so there's also not like a direct measurement there. And another thing to point out is the Randall cycle studies, a lot of them, as Jay mentioned, were done in rats. So that doesn't like just because a study is done in a rat doesn't necessarily mean that it's false. Now, this is a little tangential. Jay and I have talked about it. Rat digestive physiology and disposal of certain nutrients that differ to a bit between humans and some of the other animals. However, when you go and you're looking at like mitochondrial oxidation and things like that, the, some of the mechanisms are a bit closer. So on like a whole body-wide physiologic or comparative physiologic or comparative anatomy level, there are some differences that are important to take into consideration. Like when you're looking at like fructose studies with rats versus humans. But when you're starting to look at like mitochondrial oxidation, a different substrate, and then the subsequent effects, you because of the known differences or the the more minimal differences between human and rat mitochondria, it's easier to draw conclusions. So you can't just toss out all if you toss out all the rat studies for this stuff, you would basically you couldn't put any of these things together, or even in vitro studies. A lot of the studies are in vitro, looking at like isolated cells exposed to different to different oxidative substrate. More like having a rat heart perfused with different substrate and things along those lines. So just different pieces to point out, like you can't just cut all of those things off. Right. And, and if it was the case that you're going to argue that all those rat studies aren't relevant, then the Randall cycle itself, you would be arguing that because those, those studies are what's informing a lot of these mechanisms. And yes, and you're just saying that Randall was wrong, the whole cycle is wrong, and that's fine. But then that's not what's being said, right? We're, Instead, we're being told what the Randall cycle is or isn't and, and its relevance and all of that. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. Of course, the other thing, too, is just in talking about the, the word, you know, the words and, you know, constructs and metabolic machinery and everything. So in, in Bart's videos, one of his favorite ways to critique people is to pick out some individual word that wasn't as maybe precise as it could be or even just that he decide, you know, he deems isn't accurate uh, whether or not it actually is. And uses that as as a you know why they're wrong, why he's right, and all of that, as opposed to actually 
you know, refuting or discussing the concept or bringing in some other paper, using any citation, anything like that. And so we were, we would, we wouldn't do that. Like we, when we're talking about someone's concepts, we're not looking at this minute long video that, you know, this minute long clip from Bard and saying he used this word instead of that word. We're talking about the concepts. We were jokingly discussing how he is so specific and so critical of other people's diction, of other people's word choices. Yet then he would say something like the Randall cycle is a piece of metabolic machinery when it is a construct that describes metabolic machinery. So it's, and, and again, like he's going to keep fighting back on all those things. And that's fine. We don't like that has nothing to do with what the meat of this video is. Like the point is what that Randall cycle actually is. But yeah, just to kind of clarify what you were saying there, Mike, and why we were even going down that road of of whether insulin resistance is a construct or the Randall cycle is a construct and, and all of that. And uh, yeah, I don't think I have anything else to add. I don't have any other clips to share. I, uh, you know, there's more aspects of this we could dig into, but I don't see any uh, justification to do so. Uh, based on, on, you know, everything we've discussed so far. Yeah. Yeah. Just go ahead, Danny. <laughs> I was going to wrap things up. <laughs> oh, I, all I was going to say is that the only time, the only like period you see us like making fun of word choice is related to like Bart being, I guess, a bit pedantic of, about word choice with our different videos. It's not that we like the, for us is about the information. It's about getting the concept down and then you know, that's the most, that's the most important piece, whether you call it cross inhibition or competition, the, as long as the meaning is largely there and we're really understanding what we're talking about, that's fine. But us making fun of that is because he's, he was being so particular with our word choice, with Paul's word choice, et cetera. And then the, the thing is, is like, you're particular with word choice, but then you don't know the mechanisms. It's like very, it's like a weird <laughs> It's a weird way to be about it. It was just so, yeah. so you're suggesting there might be a physiological state with being pedantic and humorless. Is that a possibility? Do you think? Or? No laughing, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, Danny. It's just we're just a bunch of prepubescent schoolgirls, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, well, and Mike, also as you're saying, again, it's also such a one way street, right? It's it's so critical of someone else's, and then you know someone else is saying burn instead of oxidize and then you say lock the doors like it's you both are analogies everyone knows that the there's not a little fire inside the cell or inside the mitochondria that's burning but he critiqued paul on saying that you know fat was burned or uh, or glucose was burned and, and yeah that's what what you guys are both getting at there's no point in going down that road it's just purely humor to us yeah and i think i think that's why we were so nonchalant in our first episode about it is because it was just like the mechanisms clearly weren't right and then the to not have the mechanisms right and then be super critical of somebody else is just it's ridiculous it's just it's just such a weird perspective to bring to the table like i just i don't know it was it, it was it was kind of funny to us it's like very there's no other way to to deal with it that's really funny and and I don't, I don't think I have much else to add here, but I, the one last thing I do want to say is I fully anticipate Bart making lots more videos about us, about our content, certainly about this one. I'm sure, you know, if this one's what an hour and a half, two hours long, his will be like eight hours or something. I don't anticipate making any other videos about him, any responses. He can say whatever he wants. It's totally fine. I think the information speaks for itself and we'll continue sharing that sort of information and physiology really regardless of what he says. Um, we'll share studies. We'll share, you know, We'll go through graphics. We'll actually explain the things as opposed to just saying, no, this person's false. This person's wrong. I'm right. Look how many years I've been a professor. Things like that. You know, that's yeah. not our, our MO. So. I'm just waiting. Like Bart didn't even share a single reference in response to anything that we said. Like he didn't go through a Randall paper. He just makes claims and then says things are wrong and then asks for people to point out where he's wrong. And then there's no like, is he going to pull Randall papers now? And then discuss where we were wrong in our description using a Randall paper. Like, I would love to see that. That would be a scientific debate. So. Yeah. And that's not what it's about, right? It, he's got to be right. And that's fine. I know he's not going to go through this and at any point be like, yes, I was wrong there. Yes, I was wrong. That's fine. I don't need him to do that. We don't expect him to do that, especially in front. You know, he's got a he's got his persona. He's got his, you know, people who need to look at him a certain way. And, and that's fine. I mean, I don't anticipate this actually being productive from anything on that side. But at least for our listeners and for the other, other listeners, maybe there's uh, some information here in terms of the rental cycle that's, that's beneficial and, and uh, want some support as to what's actually going on. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, 
let everybody know where we can find more of your work on the internet this week. Sure. My website's jfeldmanwellness.com and Mike and I do a podcast called the Energy Balance Podcast. Uh, I do, as Jay mentioned, we do a podcast together. My website's mikefavemp.com and then I have a YouTube channel, Mike Fave. Give us a subscribe, guys, if you're uh, enjoying the show. I really appreciate that. And we, we got a lot of subscribers from Bart posting videos about us. So thank you to Bart as well. <laughs> of course. Yes. Okay, guys, we'll see you again soon. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. And thank you, Mike, for putting so much effort and work into that. Really appreciate it. And we have an amazing listenership. And we're very lucky and fortunate. So thank you, guys. Uh, see you guys soon. And thanks again. Peace out.